I think let's get started. So today we're in the Beyond Satisfiability seminar series. Um, and perhaps one of the smallest steps beyond SAT is to take a, a satisfiability, a, a SAT formula plus an objective. For instance, you know, satisfying as much of the formula as possible. This is known as maximum satisfiability solving or max SAT solving. It's a, a rich paradigm that captures many problems that we know and love. Uh, and we are fortunate today to have Jeremias Berg and Matti Järvisalo from the University of Helsinki, who are behind some of the, so I should say max SAT solving, I think it's fair to say that this is a dynamically developing area, lots and lots of exciting new cool algorithmic techniques in the last few years, decade or so maybe. Uh, pretty amazing performance of the best solvers, I'm sure uh, Jeremias and Matti will tell us about it. Um, and they're very well placed to do so since they are behind some of these cutting edge techniques and the cutting edge solvers. So with that, without further ado, uh, Matti and Jeremias, the floor is all yours. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation. You can hear me, right? Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we, we, we're splitting this sort of switching between me and Jeremias. Uh, and uh, I think there's a place for a break there after Jeremias' first turn. But I'll, I'll start with an intro now. So, so the story behind this is that this is sort of a revised and truncated version of an earlier tutorial on Maxat that we gave at ECAI last year. Uh, and this, that then built on, on a tutorial that we gave with Fahim. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, last year with Ruben. Ruben unfortunately couldn't uh, make it today because of his uh, personal schedules got really, really bad. Um, and yeah, and, and, and that tutorial was based on an earlier tutorial that we gave with Fahim at, at AAAI some years ago. But hopefully this is uh, slightly updated and, and, and more, even more sort of a by example. And, and here we're really focusing on solving rather than encoding problems with Maxat due to the time constraints. But let me continue. Hopefully this uh, will bring something new to some of the participants, but this is uh, rather high level and, and, and non-technical still. So, so what we're talking about today is, is Maxat or maximum satisfiability. And as, as, as Jakob already uh, spelled it out, so this uh, is an exact Boolean optimization paradigm that uh, essentially builds on, on Boolean satisfiability solving and, and it's, it's, it's remarkable success uh, and, and really takes SAT solvers and, and applies them iteratively to solve optimization uh, problems. And uh, due to the, yeah, the great progress made in recent years in, in, the, in the solvers, there's, there's really an expanding range of real world applications where Maxat is, is the uh, declarative optimization paradigm of choice even. So it really offers an alternative, for example, and more to more classical uh, approaches, uh, such as, of course, one has to mention mixed integer programming. And, uh, and in Maxad, of course, we can provide provably optimal solutions. We can even, uh, in principle, provide proofs. Um, yeah, and, and it's really, uh, since we're modeling problems with logic, so it's just like in SAT, this is very much a suited paradigm, especially in cases where the problems, underlying problems that we want to solve uh, yield sort of natural encodings in logic but but this branches on to just like the success of sad to more and more uh, heterogeneous domains problem domains so uh, i'll give a brief motivation and basic concepts uh, and then we'll turn to the core part of the the, the talk with namely uh, max sat solving and we're really focusing on and on particular uh, types of uh, algorithms that have turned out to be some of the most successful ones when we will we'll cover both complete and so-called complete and incomplete algorithms. Yeah, so of course, we're, when you're talking about SAT, we, that's your problem. So we were given a propositional logic formula and we asked whether it's satisfiable and it's in, in, and hope we all know by now uh, attending the Simons Institute series and, and all the other developments going on that SAT is indeed a great success story, not just a 
theoretical tool. Uh, and this is due to such solvers. And, and why I'm mentioning this again is that uh, when it comes to Maxat and building Maxat solvers, the, the, the most important thing is that we have such solvers that can prove the non-existence of solutions and in particular provide explanations for the non-existence of solutions. Uh, so yeah, and, and there's of course been this great uh, uh, remarkable improvement in SAT solvers, but I'll show you a similar plot uh, for Maxat. Uh, but the point is, yeah, we're using these core MP search procedures, uh, SAT solvers to, uh, for optimization. And why do we want, why, why is optimization interesting? It's because one could even claim that most often in the real world, there's some sort of an objective that we need to uh, minimize or maximize in terms of. So, so we want to find the best solutions, whatever best means, and it depends on your domain. We might want to find the least resource consuming schedule, shortest something uh, most, yeah, resource consuming can mean many things, you know, human resources, uh, money, uh, whatnot. Or we might want to find smallest explanations uh, in debugging configuration or even explaining, uh, uh, say, machine learning models. So there is indeed high demand for uh, automated approaches to finding good solutions or ideally optimal solutions to computationally hard optimization problems. Uh, and, and this is where Maxat today uh, pops in. Uh, we, we're, we're not gonna talk about much, much at all about applications. There's a lot of reasons, uh, as I already said, uh, drastically increasing number of success, uh, successful applications of Maxat in various types of domains. Uh, here are some sort of high level titles for the types of problems that Maxat has been successful in recently. Uh, I would actually advise people to pick up the, the now very much up and coming uh, second volume or edition of the uh, handbook on SAT where, where there's an updated uh, chapter on Maxat where some of these uh, domains are uh, discussed a bit more and, and there's also plenty of references to check out. Matte, I have a question regarding yeah. this impressive list. Uh, it's, it's a slightly vague question, but uh, let's see if I can make it to make sense. Uh, when I go to this AI conference, I get the feeling that some applications for say SAT solving or answer set programming or, or Maxat or whatever are more like applications in academia that researchers have figured out that in principle you can do this and then they code it up and they evaluate it. And some applications are more like maybe actually in industry, you know, being deployed to solve real problems. Mm, um, mm. Definitely like my understanding is that for SAT solvers that, you know, Intel and other companies are actually using these tools to verify their processor designs, for instance. Do, do you have anything to say about like what kind of math set applications are actually deployed and which one are more at an academic stage if the question makes sense yeah it, it does it's it's a it's a tough question though because i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm i work in the academia <laughs> but uh as you mentioned intel for example let me give a short answer and a very vague answer to your vague question so um, one example comes from Intel, where, where people at Intel are, are actually developing some of the state-of-the-art tools as, uh, for Maxat, uh, and, and surely, there is a, surely there is a reason why they are doing that. Uh, so I think in, just like in, in, in SAT, there's problems that really are uh, sort of nicely formulated with logic. And, and I believe this sort of extends to optimization as well. Fair enough, thanks. Yeah, and all these, these improvements are really sort of why these all these applications are popping up are due to the fact that Maxat solvers are, are getting more and more efficient. And that's why we're talking about the algorithms today. Uh, and I, maybe I'll continue with, an, with my answer to Jakob. I should say that uh, when there's a chance of beating the state-of-the-art commercial 
mixed integer programming tools, then I believe uh, it's in itself clear that that these solvers can be used in 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 beyond academia. Yeah. So so uh, so just to make it more illustrative, so. Uh, Probably you've seen these plots for SAT solver performance. So the higher, the better nowadays. Uh, it used to be the more right, the better, but now it's the higher, the better. So essentially what we've seen uh, within the last say 10 years is, is a similar progress than we've seen a start a bit earlier for SAT solvers. Now it's happening for max SAT solvers. So essentially if you take, there's uh, take uh, standard benchmarks and run them on, on the best, uh, uh, solver implementations from different years in, in a MaxSat evaluation, you will see really on the same hardware, you will see that there is indeed uh, evident progress uh, from, from year to one year to the next. Okay, so basic concept. So uh, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So we're talking about MaxSat. So again, uh, in, in its purest form, uh, we our input is just a set of clauses, so conjunctive normal form formula, and and we're asked to uh, find a a satisfying truth assignment that that uh, satisfies as many of the clauses in the in the formula as possible. Yes. And um, this is of course in its purest form, Maxat, and and what's what's typically uh, how it's presented in in in. in uh, complexity uh, books and, and and things like that, but of course this is not that convenient for modeling practical problems, uh, and that's why we nowadays, uh, when I say maxad, we mean essentially weighted partial maxad, so we can uh, we can associate weights uh, weights with with clauses, so we can have weighted soft clauses or so soft constraints, and then of course we can we can uh, associate infinite weights to some clauses, meaning that they are hard, they have to be satisfied by any solution. And so if you if you're allowed to deem some clauses as hard, you talk about partial maxad, and then if you're allowed to use non-unit weights uh, on soft clauses, then talk about weighted maxad. So we're talking about weighted partial maxad. Um, so here's a, a, a neat example that we're going to use uh, to illustrate all of the algorithms that we're going to talk about today. So pay attention. This is not to say that this is a state of the art. A max that is a state of the art uh, approach to finding shortest paths in grids. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> this is just for illustrational purposes because it's nicer to have something concrete to illustrate algorithms on rather than just clauses. Um, hopefully this will work out well to you as well. So, okay, so the point is that we, we, we get, we're in a grid. Uh, so, there, so there's a start uh, uh, cell and, and a goal cell. Uh, so we want to find a path uh, uh, using hor horizontal and vertical moves going from S to G. Uh, and we want to find a shortest path from S to G. And there's some blocked squares that we can't uh, enter, go through. Uh, so here, for example, a shortest path would go from, from, from S to A, C, D, E, E, L, R. That's one, and G, that's one shortest path. As I said, so this is really to, for, for mere illustration, but you also now see the only encoding that you'll see in the talk. So how do we encode this in, 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 in Maxad? And so we need to take some Boolean variables. So here's sort of a, a unary encoding. So we take, for each uh, unblocked grid square, uh, a Boolean variable and associate the grid's name with the, with the variable. So it's S, G, A, B, and so forth. And, and, and it's intended, uh, meaning is each of these variables is that it's, it's true if and only if uh, the, passing, uh, the, the square in question is visited by our path that we're constructing. Now the constraints. So, so to start off, we can pose, see immediately two constraints. So we need to visit S and we need to visit G because we want to find a path from S to G. So we're going to impose unit hard clauses, uh, S and G. Let's, let's 
for with all solutions where S and G is not in. And now, uh, since we want to find the shortest path, we can penalize uh, including uh, each particular cell to the path uh, by, by these soft unit constraints. So we have soft clauses of weights one, uh, namely stating that unless you do not visit, un you, unless you do not not visit A, <laughs> so, a, so uh, then you will get a penalty of one, meaning that if you enter A uh, in the, the path, A is on the path you construct, then you're gonna get a, a, a penalty of one. And uh, now we need to still enforce the existence of a path between S and G uh, with good additional hard clauses, right? So uh, one way to think about it is that we're gonna leave from S and we're gonna end, end up in G. So we need to uh, have a, exactly one visited neighbor for both S and G. And then all of the other squares that are visited by our path need to have exactly two visited neighbors, one predecessor and one successor. Okay, so, so exactly one visited neighbor, this is quite easy. So uh, in logic, so propositional logic, so the neighbors of S and uh, are A and B. So we need to state an exactly one constraint over A and B. So A plus B is one. And it's just the exclusive or uh, over A and B. So it's, it's, which is the clauses A or B and, and not A or not B in, in conjunctive normal form. Similarly for G, uh, well, it has three uh, neighbors and we should visit exactly one of them. So it gets a bit more hairy because we have more than two uh, neighbors to talk about. So at least one is easy, it's just the clause saying, saying we see K, Q or R. And at most one in CNF, we can, for example, state with pair, pairwise disallowing uh, all pairs of, of, over the three uh, grid positions. So, so not K or not Q and so forth. Uh, and now, to talk about the intermediate uh, squares uh, or grid cells on our path, we need to say that each of them, if they are on the path, then they have to have exactly two visited neighbors. So now it's a sort of a conditional uh, or reified constraint saying that if, if uh, we take the penalty of uh, including E, for example, on our path, then uh, there, there's exactly two of D, J, L, and F, uh, so the horizontal and vertical neighbors of E that are visited by the path, okay? Now this of course requires encoding the cardinality constraint over uh, here in C and F, but the good thing is that without going any in, more into detail, there's, this is of course cardinality constraints pop up all over the place in, in the real world. So, so the SAT community has, has developed quite efficient and, and, and compact encodings for such things. So we know that this can be done and these are just hard clauses. So it's just a SAT encoding. So the, it's just a SAT encoding in, uh, with an addition of the soft clauses, unit soft clauses that, that penalize uh, visiting the individual grid cells or squares. And that's our max adding goal. Uh, so yeah, so now this gives us any solution will give us a some sort of a path and then uh, a max add solution or an optimal max add solution would be then something that, that uh, violates uh, as few as possible of the units of constraints. For example, the green path. So an optimal solution uh, has cost eight in, in this, this particular grid. Okay, so remember this, we're gonna use this, you will see this grid uh, uh, later on. Um, but yeah, 
just a word on the complexity. So, so of course, deciding whether whether k clauses of a of a given CNF formula can be satisfied that's an NP complete problem. It's quite easy to see uh, because SAT is NP NP complete. So, what what we can essentially algorithmically do is iterate over the the k and 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 uh, for example with linear search and, and to find a, a an optimal. Uh, uh, solution to pure max sat instances uh, and, and and it's actually sort of fp np complete uh, so uh, in in general so we, we essentially just need a polynomial number of, of sat oracle calls uh, in practice and this is really what's 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 done we have our first question mati mm -hmm. uh, or second i guess i already asked one oh. the first one in the chat uh, so are the at most constraints necessary in the encoding for the shortest paths? They're necessary for the SAT solver to produce a valid path, but the max SAT solver will remove dead ends anyway, right? As, as for Ooh. The... That is a very good question. I would say that the, that you're right in that that most constraints are not needed, but in practice, I assume that a set solver does better if you include them. They lead to more propagation and give you more information. So the individual calls will be faster, but formally speaking, you would not need them to get a correct encoding, but you'll get a better one. Yeah, you, you still can introduce, yeah, cycles, uh, cyclic subtors. So it should be fine. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. Yeah. Hmm. Stefan doesn't agree. Uh, that might be true, actually. Good question. Unrooted circles. Yeah, that's that's the scare of it. So yeah, I thought this through once. I had this question before. So yeah, the the issue could be that you could have sort of sub uh, tours that are disconnected. So just to point out, because I think when this is being uh, sent on, on YouTube, people can't see the chat that we see. So Stefan Gocht is writing, I think you could have unrooted circles without the utmost constraints, and this could lead to an unconnected path. I mean, it's, it's true that the fact that this encoding is correct seems to use this parity argument that only the source and the sink have odd parity, right? Yeah. So if I'm allowed to disconnect, then I'll make a small cycle somewhere around the source yeah. and another small single yeah, exactly. uh, circle with a fork somewhere around the sink. And now I have a really short path. So it might be that it's actually needed. And Sam Bus is having the same concern that if you, I think Sam is saying that if we remove this, this would not force the end nodes to be connected. I think we're using like the parity argument to connect. The yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I, I had to think this through. I had this, I should remember the answer to this question because I had this question before. Okay, so. Um, so, but let me continue. So, so we'll use this for illustration of the algorithms. And so you'll see sort of the algorithm work on the grid rather than CNF. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so yeah, just like in SAT solvers, uh, there's, uh, these are, max SAT solvers are push button uh, solvers. So, so you don't really need command line parameters, especially for the complete solvers. And, and, and there's, a, there's just like for SAT solvers, there's the Dimex CNF format, there's the Dimex W CNF format, which essentially uh, differs only in, in, in that, that where this is a clause uh, over the variable indexes one, two, and three, and then X1 is negated. Uh, there's, there's uh, uh, before the clause, as, as the first thing on, on each line, there's a, a uh, weight. And, and there's, there's a so-called top weight that allows you to uh, state that particular clause is hard. Uh, so sort of representing infinite weight, essentially. Uh, 
Oh, so in the format, there are no hard clauses, but you have to make them hard by uh, making yeah, ridiculously so, large weights. So this is this is uh, perhaps should the standard. If you ask me personally, the standard should be changed, and one could use the uh, the letter H, for example, to start a hard clause, because computing the top is also a bit. Uh, 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 not so nice and then what you see is people develop uh, producing sat max sat instances uh, the interpretation of which can depend on the solver because of the, how they, they're parsed and then whether whether for example the top is assumed to actually refer to something that's exactly stating what's a hard clause or and, and whatnot so there's actually some problems with this and then and, and, and this would be nice to change Oh, you mean if I add a, if I give a top value that is actually too low, then it might be solver dependent whether this is treated as a hard clause or a, a soft yeah. clause with this particular weight. Yeah, exactly. that sounds a and, little and, bit scary. And, and, and also, so if you sum up the the weights for the soft clauses, should the top be higher than that? And then you you know you get representational issues as well. If you don't know what's the optimal solution and the cost of an optimal solution, right? Uh, what the what should the top be? And and if yeah. you sum up all the the weights, that could be a ridiculously large number. I guess Sibyl is noting this in the chat. Also, this is, seems to be platform dependent. Uh, yeah. The, okay. But this is the format we have for today. Yes. We're not yes. going to change it before yes. the end of the seminar. Unfortunately, no. Uh, yeah, and 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 so yeah, I, and and as I showed you the, showed you the plot and mentioned Maxat evaluations, there is this uh, annual event called uh, Maxat evaluation that, just like in SAT competitions, uh, aims to assess the state of the art in Maxat solvers and then produce these benchmark sets that can be used in research and work and and developing further solvers. And uh, this is not a, as huge as the SAT competition series in terms of the number of participants, that, but there are various solvers uh, each year being evaluated. It's not a competition per se, but aims to be more of an evaluation with the less uh, strict criteria for, um, for uh, participating. Uh, and, and nowadays there's tracks for both complete and incomplete solvers that we're going to talk about today. Um, yeah, and I should mention that, oh, I do mention it. Okay, so yeah, so Maxat solver is just a practical, so it's an implementation of an algorithm for finding solutions to Maxat, given Maxat instances. Complete solvers uh, are guaranteed to find optimal solutions so probably optimal solutions to any instance given of resources and, and, and incomplete solvers are essentially tailored, uh, whereas complete solvers are tend to be allowed to use a lot of resources, incomplete solvers are tailored towards producing relatively good solutions, whatever the interpretation of that means, is uh, to even very large instances uh, fairly quickly. So for example, uh, the, in the evaluations, the complete solvers are given per instance time limit around one hour, whereas incomplete are run for a minute or five minutes per instance. But there needs to, for incomplete, there needs to be no guarantees on how good the solutions are really. Uh, yeah, when it comes to Maxed evaluation, I want to mention that nowadays we have an open resource, open source, uh, requirement uh, starting from a, a few years back uh, and before that the, the solvers were mostly available in binary but nowadays uh, we're trying to really make people produce open source maxat solvers because this is how this uh, part of the reason why sat is such a success that, so that anyone can build on on previous solvers and hopefully this will be picked up on more and more Okay, so let's now get to the algorithms. Uh, uh, so, and we'll start with the complete algorithms and, and, and in the end, we'll get to the incomplete ones, which actually mix sort of ideas from complete solvers. So that's why actually you noticed the hyphens in, in, the, 
the incomplete uh, solver description a couple of slides ago. So that tried to refer to the fact that there some of the incomplete solvers, if you run them for enough long long enough, they will actually provide optimal solutions. But it really depends on on the algorithmic foundation of the solvers. So when it comes to uh, complete solvers, there's you can categorize the, the main uh, sort of uh, mainstream algorithmic approaches developed uh, as follows. So there's there's a branch and sort of a specialized branch and bound approach that can be very effective on on small but hard and, and randomly generated instances in particular. Uh, but we we're not going to focus on this today. But we're going to talk about the, the 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 perhaps one can say more recent developments. That that can scale to very very large inst max out instances. Uh, namely, these are all using uh, to one extent or another, but to a far extent in any case, SAT solvers. And and when it comes to these SAT based max out algorithms, there's essentially three three types of uh, 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 approaches, so called model improving approaches. Uh, uh, core guided approaches and and the implicit hitting set approach and 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 due to the fact that uh, well due to the time constraints uh, and 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 also due to the fact that well the core guided uh, approach is implemented uh, by by the 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 greatest number of of solvers nowadays available and 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 core guided together the implicit hitting set approach uh, turns out to be quite effective nowadays. So we'll we'll outline uh, these approaches, and then uh, after that we'll turn to incomplete and 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 explain how 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 to combine some of the ideas from these approaches and different ideas as well to towards incomplete solve. So, I, but just very shortly, I mentioned model improving. So, what does this mean? So, it essentially refers to searching for for the optimal bound uh, on the cost uh, from top top down uh, in terms of the cost function range. So, 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 we just instantiate the the uh, upper bound to be. Uh, all the number of soft clauses when we talk about unweighted instances. And then we can ask essentially a SAT solver whether we can set it, whether the SAT solver can find a better solution always. So can you unset, uh, can you leave unset, so falsified uh, less than the current bound number of clauses? So can you satisfy more clauses than the currently best solution found? And, and as long as you find a satisfying uh, uh, truth assignment with a SAT solver to this query, then you update the, the, your, your working formula with a tighter bound. So this is essentially a cardinality constraint uh, that we're adding each time to the SAT solver and asking again. And uh, as, uh, if we do this li by linear search from top down, then, then of course, uh, immediately when the set solver says, no, there's no solution, you, we know that the previous solution was, was an optimal. So this approach can be quite efficient. Uh, uh, so a think, question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so does it make sense at all to consider binary search in this setting rather than linear search? Yeah, this can be done, and and it has been also proposed. Uh, but I believe there's no really in the current sort of state of the art. There's no solver that does does a binary search. Jeremias, I'm I'm right on this. I I I don't I'm not aware of one. So there used Me to neither, be earlier no. on. No? Yeah, there used to be yeah. earlier on one that combined this model improvement with so-called core guided. Uh, but it's 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 sort of gone away. Yeah. No. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. So so model improving can be very efficient when when the when the actual optimal cost is quite high. Uh, so you can't really satisfy many soft clauses because then you're bound to terminate quite quickly. Um, and and there are solvers that use variants of this algorithm, so one shouldn't totally disregard this at all. So there are cases where this is, can be very effective, 
and and uh, going beyond complete as the other will spell out uh, in more detail later this uh, this approach is indeed applied uh, together with other things uh, in in the realm of incomplete solving so just adding that there's a comment from armin Biere in the chat uh, that mm -hmm. fahim explained last time that binary search risks to overshoot the best solution quite a bit uh, and this produces large formulas oh because you have to re-encode every time mm, i guess yeah also. Yeah. yeah well so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's one of these clashes of theory and practice right as a theoretician of course yeah, you should so, do binary search and except in practice you don't want to do it yeah yeah it, i i i think it the because it's really dependent on the instance and and its optimal cost yeah there's it feels like there's always instances on which it will not work well because of this, what Armin wrote. Uh, so it will overshoot when there's an opportunity to overshoot. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, but we'll turn to now core guided. Uh, and and t as a prequel to core guided, Jeremy will talk about core guided more in, in a moment, but let me just uh, spell out that just like you can do model improving from top down, you can go bottom up and do, you could do a lower bound search, of course. And, and, and you would just go ahead and ask if you can satisfy all soft clauses. And this is of course what, what, what you would do for as the first step in essentially any Maxat algorithm that uses a SAT solver, because this is a very cheap first check. Um, hmm. uh, okay, so, uh, and, and, and then you can just, you know, go on to ask, okay, what, okay, is there a worse solution? If this one doesn't have a solution. And this is quite bad now, because now we don't have even a solution. And, and when you go on and do this, uh, you have to use these cardinality constraints, just like in model improvement. But you don't really get uh, information from these unsat uh, cases if you don't do something else, if you don't rely on what the solver uh, can really provide us. Sorry for uh, disturbing, Mati. I'm just adding one more comment from the chat here so that everybody can hear it that in constraint programming, it's usually that only a few values on either side of the objective are really hard, but sometimes you get nasty instances where even a lot over the objective is really hard. These are particularly nasty for binary search, writes Kieran McCreesh. Sorry for interrupting, please go on. Mm. Yeah, yeah, approaching the, but op approaching an optimal bound can be very hard. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you approach it sort of carefully. I think it's also for the model improving it's a challenge. Okay, yeah, but the point is that, that you don't really get information if you don't use some additional information that the solver provides us. And this is why this approach in it, in, in, like this is not really implemented at all. But, but the, now the point is that we, we can use more information from the solver because we can get unsatisfiable cores that, uh, that give us hints towards what, what subsets of the soft clauses uh, are conflicting with each other and producing conflicts. And, and now we can actually stay essentially uh, start relaxing these uh, soft clauses using this core information and in these cores, what they yield are much tighter cardinality constraints towards an optimal solution. And now this is essentially what the core guided solvers do. And, and, and this is how you can scale to millions of variables. So just to state uh, uh, by an example, so if you have a CNF formula that's unsatisfiable, anything uh, that, that's unsatisfiable, that big, uh, a subset of the clauses that's unsatisfiable is called an unsatisfiable core. And, and what we would hope that this is that the solver provides us a small unsatisfiable cores because then we can uh, do this, uh, uh, impose this tighter cardinality constraint uh, when, when at the next iteration of, of the solving algorithm. And of course in Maxa, 
the point is that the, the course talk about soft causes. So the hard constraints are sort of a, a background theory. So you do always these checks, all hard causes on, and then uh, you have soft causes, uh, a subset of soft causes that together with the hard causes are unsatisfiable. And, and the course are just talk about this subset of soft causes. There's a question, are these unset cores computed only for the soft clauses to rule yes. them out, asks I, Sibylla. I hope I, I hope I just said it, yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in, in, in not too many words. Yes, exactly. So the hard clauses are always there, but they're not in the, don't occur in the, in the course themselves. So uh, now we're getting to this illustration. Uh, that we're going to use for the algorithm. So for example, remember our uh, shortest path problem. And now what we have is the hard constraint stating that uh, S uh, is, has to be visited. And, and because we visit S, we have to visit exactly one of A and B. And now we have the soft clauses stating that don't visit A, don't visit B. Well, I would prefer you not to visit A. I would prefer you not to visit B. Uh, so now, uh, if, if you add these, you have these clauses, uh, add these clauses and the hard clone states, the SAT solver, the solver will say unsat. And, and one of the cores it can return is exactly these. Uh, the the, the uh, clause that is, is the, the, the negation of, of, consists of the negations of these unit clauses. And that's a core, because what the core is really stating is that if you, any path that goes from S to G has to go through A or B. So you cannot satisfy both of these soft clauses. So that's an unset core in one sense. Okay. All right. So now I'll let's let's allow Jeremes to pick up uh, on, on this and, and, and uh, give you details on some of the core guided algorithms. Yes, thank you. You need to stop sharing so I can share instead. So hello, everyone. Nice to see so many people here. And I'll continue from the exact next slide. I hope it's visible now. So <clears throat> as Matti already mentioned, core guided algorithms are the one type that is mostly implemented by the solvers that are, that are available today starting from 2006 with the so-called Fu Malik algorithm. There's been new solvers almost every year, not quite, but, but as recently as last year. And there are various differences between these. They use various different heuristics and clever tricks, which are a bit too subtle for me to have time to go into here. So what I want to do instead is to focus on sort of two high level views on how to use the cores. The first one I'll call you want an approach where you take all of the cores that you find and then you relax them together. And the second one is where you try to use, make as much use of the information provided by individual cores as possible by relaxing the cores separately. These boldenings of solver names should be taken with a grain of salt. As I already said, many solvers use also sort of combinations of these techniques. But on a really high level and a bit roughly, you could separate the core guided algorithms into these two groups. Okay, so first starting with the approach where you try to relax the cores together, which is implemented by, by others, among others by the so-called MSU3 algorithm. Here, we start by initializing a set that I'll call R to be the soft clauses that need to be relaxed or the squares that we can visit in this example and a lower bound. Initially, we have the lower bound set to zero. Then we ask the SAT solver, can we find a solution that satisfies all of our hard clauses and unsatisfies at most lower bound from the set R. So instantiated here, we're asking for a path that visits at most the, our lower bound uh, amount of nodes from the set R. So initially we're asking, is there a path that goes through no nodes in the set R? 
And this is, this is of course, unsatisfiable. And the SAT solver will give us an explanation for why it, why it is unsatisfiable, one of these cores. So say it return, gives you this one containing A and B, like Matti said, that they form a core. And now we can then update our set R to include the nodes A and B, and also increase the lower bound. So in the next iteration, we are asking, is there a path that visits at most one node from the set R that now contains A and B and no others? So can we go from S to G via only one node from A or B? And this is still unsatisfiable and we'll get a new core, say for example, the one containing C, the nodes C and G or the soft clauses corresponding to these nodes. And then we again, bump up our lower bound and keep going. In the fifth iteration, we might have found cores corresponding, containing all of the nodes here in gray. And now we're asking for a, a or it's the sixth iteration, I think actually, we're asking for a, a path that goes through these gray nodes, but at most five of them. And we still can't find one and we get our, but then we get our final core and ask the SAT solver for a path that goes through at most six of the nodes in this set. And now it finds one, which we, de which, which we then return as an optimal solution. And Yenemias, are you going to tell me where these numbers came from? Uh, which numbers? This uh, two increase to five to six. Uh, it's just a basic uh, sort of lower bound linear search. We're trying to find a cost, a solution of cost zero. If we can't, we then have to say, well, how about a solution of cost one? And then if we can't, we bump it up to two. And then we keep going until we find the first bound where we can find the solution. So it's just, we start from the trivial lower bound of zero, and then we keep increasing it until we get satisfiable. So the difference to this naive approach is that we're not considering all of the soft clauses. We're not allowing the SAT solver to, to falsify all soft clauses, but only soft clauses that have appeared in some of the course that we find along the way. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So, so in this particular example, we, we end up with not having to consider this soft clause corresponding to the O here at all. So we'll just keep on saying that you're not supposed to visit it. You, we're only allowing the falsification of the soft clauses corresponding to these gray nodes, not all of them, which is the difference between this and the naive lower bounding search that Matti mm -hmm. talked about. And I noticed in Matti's presentation that I'm actually saying in my examples, we're not gonna incur costs for the starting or, or gold node. So hence the cost of an optimal solution for me is going to be six. So we visit six nodes along the way. That's a minor difference. Sorry about that. So this algorithm can be quite efficient and it is used in practice in solvers that exist today. And especially if the cores that you find are fairly small, then you don't have to relax then the set of soft clauses you end up relaxing it's small and if if you can find a solution of a low cost so remember that here we're, we're starting from zero and then we're just bumping it up in unweighted case by one each time so if your optimal solution has a low cost then you don't have to do that many iterations and hence you might be able to terminate quicker so i have another technical question yeah. so th the this fact that you're allowed to falsify and so and so many of the soft clauses this will now be encoded in cnf in some nifty way that you have for encoding your cardinality constraints yeah this is exactly i think it, what it's going to be my, my next sentence would be that the problem or the challenge of this is that you still have to do a cardinality constraint that says you're only allowed to falsify at most so and so many clauses and then I'm wondering if we are we perhaps also using here, I think, which I think is a standard trick in MaxSat solving, but I'm not sure if it's obvious to everybody that without loss of generality, you can have like a pre-processing step where you rewrite your problem so that 
all the soft clauses are actually unit clauses, and that's why you yes. just minimize the sum of the blocking variables, right? Exactly. Or this is or maybe you said this and I missed it, but uh, we didn't, and it and, and this is a very good point if you want to talk about how to actually implement these solvers. But in practice, all of the implementations of all algorithms that I'm aware of do this trick. So. So we can assume that any kind of soft clauses that you have are going to be of this form of, with a unit negative literal. If you have an instance where that's not true, then you just simply take a new literal, add that to your or original soft clause, treat that as hard, and then add the new literal as a unit negation as soft. Mm -hmm. This is a sort of technical, important technical detail that you need when you but if you want to implement your maps as solver, you can contact me and I'll, I'll talk, tell you more about that. And now the other problem with we might this, take you up you, on that. Oh, we might take you up on that promise, you know, just that <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> uh, so in addition to the fact that you still need this cardinality constraint, which can be a bit tricky and can be a bit large, Another problem with this relaxing all course at one approach is that you sort of, in a certain, certain sense, you lose information that a course could provide. You're not making full use of this course. So if you go back to the same example and look at what's happening in the third iteration, as I said, we're now asking, asking the SAT solver for a path that visits at most two of these gray nodes and goes from S to G. However, based on the course that we extracted, we actually know something stronger. Matti already alluded to this. We extracted a core containing the clauses corresponding to A and B. And the fact that it is a core says that any path between S and G has to go through either A or B. And similarly for the second core, we also know that any path needs to go through either C or G. So this constraint here is in a certain sense too loose. We know that the solutions to this here, which for example would set C to true and G to true are not gonna correspond to actual models. But in this algorithm, we're not telling the SAT solver this. We're not letting it make, you, make use of, of, of this knowledge that we have just by core extractions. And Carlos is saying in the chat that, that you can also use different cardinality constraints for non-overlapping cores. Yeah, and this is, goes, and that's absolutely absolutely true. And for this type of algorithm, this, this picking your cardinality constraint smartly when you have non-overlapping cores is one of the key features that makes it effective. This example here is a bit easy because all of your cores are non-overlapping, but it can, but there are some clever things you can do. If, if for more complex instances. But the way in which the way in which I want to take this from here is instead to talk about this second alternative that I mentioned, which is to make use of this information by relaxing each core separately. So if we go back to the same example, this time around we're taking a so-called working instance, which I denote by H, H0, the initial hard clauses, and S0, the initial soft clauses. And then we first ask the SAT solver for a model that would satisfy all of the hard clauses and all of the soft clauses. So implicitly, the first call is asking, do we have a, do we have a solution to this max out problem that has cost zero? But more importantly, in this case, we can also see this call to ask for a, this will get clearer in a second, but I'll say for the first time now, the call is asking for a path that goes, visits at most one node from each of the found cores. So initially we have no cores. So we're asking for a path of length zero of one that visits at most one node from each of our zero cores. And similarly to before, this is of course unsatisfiable and we get a core. And now this time around, 
we relax this core immediately into the instance. So in the sense we're encoding the information provided by this core into the instance itself. We're saying, okay, so A and B, the soft process A and B form a core. So in subsequent iterations, you're allowed to falsify at most one of them because we know that any optimal solution has to falsify at most one of them. So we go back to the set solver and now we know that we need to falsify at least one clause. We found one course, course, so we know that we have to falsify at least one soft clause. And now we're asking the set solver, is there a path that visits at most one from this one core that we actually found? And still we cannot get to the goal, goal node. So the next core we might get from the solver might be at something like this. This is saying that you need to visit at least one of these nodes. And now we can again do the same thing. We re-relax the instance saying, okay, so in, in subsequent iterations, you're allowed to falsify one node from this core and one node from this core. And then we go back and then we keep going until we found enough of these cores to actually allow, allow us to terminate. So after we found, uh, I think it's five, six cores, we now ask, is there a path between the start and the goal nodes that visits at most one node from each found core? So in other words, goes through a node of a specific color at most one time. And this time around, uh, we can of course find one and the set solver can return satisfiable and we get our model and we're happy. So in comparison to the earlier algorithm, this time the cardinality encodings are, are in a certain sense tighter. And we don't need to explicitly maintain the lower bound and the set of cores. As I said, as soon as we get a new core, uh, we'll encode, it, encode the information into the formula itself. We need, don't need to maintain it. And, and the fact that the lower bound increases by one sort of follows from the number of cores that we find. In this unweighted case, for each core that we find, we can we increase the lower bound by one. But in practical implementations, you don't need to care about what your lower bound is. You just keep going until the SAT solver give, gives you satisfiable, and then you can check what the cost of that model was. So as I said, the first instantiation of this kind of an idea was by Fu and Malik in 2006, and that was sort of the kickoff into the research for guided algorithms. And nowadays, most of the existing solvers that use this approach implement the so-called OLL algorithm, which I believe Fahim also talked about, which was, this was first proposed in the context of answer set programming and then extended to MaxAd in 2014. There are differences between these and the differences are mainly in how, how this relaxation step, what kind of clauses you add to relax the course. course. And in practice, it's quite clear that the OLL algorithm is the one you want to use at the moment, at least until someone comes up with a better one. And as I already talked about, in comparison to the other algorithm, algorithm this time, we only need cardinality constraints saying at most one of the clauses in each core can be satisfied. And these at most one constraints tend to be more effective for a SAT solver to reason over, which is a nice, nice thing to have. But then on the flip side, now you need many different cardinality constraints, one for each core. And there's also been some work in showing that when you try to extract a core from this new formula that can uh, doing so can be exponentially harder than from the original formula, especially, or I would say, actually only if you have these overlapping cores. So as long as your cores are non-overlapping, that's no problem. But as soon as you have overlapping cores, you might end up having a harder time finding your, your cores. And I guess that's it for my first part about these complete algorithms. Next, it would be, we would move on to the implicit hitting set algorithms, which Matti would talk about, but would this be a good time to have a break, maybe? I was just going to ask you, I think it is. Um, 
And before we officially take a break, are there any questions at this point from anyone? I mean, we've had a few questions in the chat. Yeah, thank you. If anything has been uh, those we've taken care of, but anyone else based on the material so far, any questions from anyone? Otherwise, while you're thinking this, what will happen now is we'll take a uh, 10 minute break, give or take. Um, There's a, can I answer so, the question? Yes, read it out and answer it, please. Uh, Victor is asking, how does one actually find the course? And in practice, you use the assumption interface um, provided by most of the SAT solvers that exist. So you call your SAT, you add this, you call your SAT solvers while assuming your soft clauses in a way that would satisfy them. If you remember, I said that in practice, you use these unit literals as soft clauses. And then both of the SAT solvers today are able, if the result is unset, the SAT solvers can give you back a subset of your assumptions, which is enough to explain unsatisfiability. And that subset will co correspond to the core. So we use SAT solvers in a black box manner to do this. Uh, the second question from Armin, are people considering to use cardinality constraints natively or at most one constraints instead of encoding? Yes, yes, for sure people are. And I think, don't quote me on this, but I, I think the Maxino, Maxat solver actually even uses PB constraints to some extent natively. In our work, we, we've had some problems getting that to be as effective as encoding or more generally speaking, having these separate sort of propagators to be more effective as, as encoding, but that's an interesting direction for sure. I just can't resist saying that there is also a pseudo Boolean solver that does this core guided uh, approach by Emir Demirovic, myself, Stefan Gocht, and, and some others. So yes, it has I've, I've, I've read the paper. Yeah, it's interesting, but I mean, so it's interesting that it seems that uh, it doesn't seem to really pay off to try to do native uh, cardinality constraints. At least... In, in Inside or maxat. Inside, yeah, yeah, in, in maxat. So, so uh, maybe it's about the explanations. Like, if you put them as propagators, you, the learning just, you know, that the learning is actually important. And, and I think it depends on how you how you use them in the conflict analysis. Also, I I, I think that yeah. could make a big difference. I mean, once you're moving to to to. Uh, suitable and constraints you can do all kinds of things like you can extract cores that are actually not just clauses but suitable and constraints. Ha have, have you done that we have this in in the paper that i put in the chat we're actually extracting the cores are not clauses they're general generic suitable and constraints uh, and then we round them to cardinality constraints in order to update the objective function but in principle you could I think Emir Demirovic suggested doing some kind of, you can extract a generic, as like a general pseudo Boolean core and then try to do some kind of dynamic programming to see how to update the objective function in the best way. There are all kinds of tricks you could try to pull, but also the pseudo Boolean conflict analysis might give you better course in the first place, even if yeah, you stick sure. to yeah, only, but, yeah, but only if closer stick, course. If we stick to Maxad, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm. To me, for to me, it's quite unclear uh, whether one can really make the would could make this pay off. Uh, but uh, yeah, I agree. It's not clear. That's why. But that's exactly why I said that the promise Jeremias made just a few minutes ago is a risky one, right? Because I think it's a very interesting question. I, I'm somewhat optimistic, but I don't know. And I'm obviously a little bit of an outsider, but I'm learning as we speak. Um. Uses. Constraint is that constraint programming solvers use resolution and it works. Lazy clause generation constraint programming solvers. I don't know, Amy, do you want to unmute <laughs> and speak maybe? Or do I need to unmute you? I can allow you to speak. No, the, that's, that, do, do you mean to say that the propagators are not needed? 
No, so can you hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, no, I was just saying that, so in lazy class generation um, constraint programming solvers, one would still use the resolution proof system. Yeah. And there, the, we would use this kind of native uh, support for kernality constraints. So it's just that you said that you don't think that in MEXAT it would be useful, which could be true, maybe. But still, like in, since in constraint programming, it seems to be useful, then there's some thing, there's some evidence that it could be also useful in MEXAT. Yeah, I, I think you, the point is that what you start off with is, is this extremely low level format. Uh, like if, if you, that's why I said, if you stick with Maxat, it's much more unclear to me whether it can pay off uh, compared to if you start with something that's a higher level declaration of your problem. I don't think, I don't think it's a matter of the proof system or so, but it's just the like effectiveness of well, that solver, solvers. Well, so it's, they're, it's, they're, it, it was more like that in CP, it wouldn't generate additional, like for example, in MaxSat you would, so I think the difference is you, you would add additional link, um, variables to the encoding. And these additional variables are very useful compared to just using a trivial explanation, let's say. So what I was saying that the, that the additional variables you introduce are very valuable for MaxSat, for example. But CP doesn't, typically doesn't use these additional variables, mm -hmm. but, it still, but it still works, which is remarkable in a sense. It's a bit surprising. But it's true that indeed there is no real work on combining this kind of constraint programming style with MaxSet. Yeah, I, it can also be that you know this this specific approaches that we have right now don't really yeah, work with these ideas, and you have to think out of the box more, not to try to build on mm -hmm. what you already have, right? Yeah, definitely. So I don't see any further questions. So maybe let's now take, a, you know, 10-ish minutes a break, enough to grab a cup of coffee and then we'll resume, I guess, let's say, yeah. So 11 minutes to the hour. So the break is officially on now.
So we are resuming in one or two minutes. That is assuming that our speakers are still available. I don't know if there are any questions that have arisen during the break. Thomas has raised his hand, I think. Uh, do I, Thomas, maybe should I, since we're having the break anyway, could I promote you to panelist maybe? Trying that. Again, since we're during the break, anyone wants to be, we'll just go ahead and promote some people unless you protest, you're not missing anything. Thanks, Jakob. Here we go. I'm in upgrade mode today. I don't know if it's the case also that uh, you'll have to tell me whether it, it's the case that uh, attendees cannot send chat messages to everybody. I'm not sure. I think it, but uh, when you're sending chat messages, please make sure to send them to both panelists and attendees, except I'm doing my best now to make sure that we don't have any attendees left and we don't have this issue. I think uh, both. By, by default, I was, I, in my chat, it sends only to panelists. Maybe you just have to switch it. Yes, and attendees can send chats also to everybody. Yeah, I guess I'm just experimenting. We're all learning this in this new fantastic Zoom world. I just uh, took the liberty to upgrade everybody to panelists. I hope you don't mind. I guess you can. <laughs> no. I'll Antonina says that attendees can only send messages to Q and A. No, I don't think that's true because no, Emil... no, I also I also sent messages to the chat when I was only attendee. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Anyway. And I think I also had could also choose whether I wanted to send to everyone or to panelists only. Uh, so but we can try uh, again. Uh, you can downgrade. Oh, sorry, uh, I'm on the wrong because I seem to remember. Uh, you might not be able to send personal messages when you're an attendee, but you might mm -hmm. be able to send to everybody. I think personal messages are hard, but this is also connecting back to what we said at the beginning. I think chat rooms might be slightly different in this regard, you know, that like okay. there might be a lot of customs. And this is a, a, a rich new world that we're all learning to live in. Um, but I think Antonina is right. No personal messages for attendees. So anyway, I think we're good to go. Um, so I'll, I'll, again, I'm monitoring the chat for questions and um, sometimes reacting quickly and sometimes not so quickly, but the speakers can also, I mean, um, it's good that Jeremias caught a, a number of chats that I missed. Um, and everybody should now be able to unmute and just ask questions. So I think let's just uh, continue. All right. Yeah, so I, I try to be fairly quick on, on this implicit hitting set part because I, I feel that there might be overlap with previous talks on this and and uh, and and it's good to give some time for Jeremias to talk about the incomplete part because that's there's quite a bit of new developments there. Uh, but yeah, for about this implicit hitting set algorithm for Maxat. So one should first of all point out that this this uh, idea general idea. Uh, underlying uh, this algorithm is, is, is essentially founded in, in writer's early work on diagnosis and, and, and it's been used in various types of settings and it, you can use it for all sorts of hard optimization problems, uh, reasoning problems, instantiated with different types of oracles, not just SAT solvers and, and IP solvers as done and in Maxat. Um, but yeah, so 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 uh, Jessica and Fahim proposed this first in their Maxa HS solver uh, for for Max, Maxat, and and it's 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 been quite uh, uh, influential, and 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 it's really uh, one of the uh, main uh, 
uh, approaches to Maxat solving these days. Um, so hitting set, I think everyone knows what's a hitting set, but of course we're given a collection of sets uh, of elements over some universe and, and, and now uh, a hitting set is then something, uh, a set of these uh, set of elements from the universe that, that include at least one element from each of the sets in our collection. And then here we're interested in optimal hitting sets. Essentially, if, if we don't weigh, have weights on the elements, then, then we're just interested in, in, in finding a, a smallest hitting set. And, and if you would have weights on the elements, uh, then you would be interested in uh, finding uh, a minimum cost hitting set. So okay. question regarding yes. weights, actually, I guess so far we've been unweighted in this ah. talk, but is there anything that actually has depended on the weight or like, or would everything you did so far extend easily to like the weighted gear? Yes. Yeah. So the core guided, so there's sort of a standard trick that you need to know how to implement and no one said how to implement it in a paper, but anyway. So you, you can uh, implement these core guided approaches. They do work for weighted partial max out, no problem at all. Uh, you essentially, when you extract the core and, and compile the core into, into your formula with these cardinality constraints, you sort of consider its residu residual weight of the clauses that were in the core. So you sort of take out the minimum uh, weight over the, the, the soft clauses in the core. And, 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 and if weight remains, you still have those soft clauses. And that's how it sort of works. Andre asks if there's a penalty in terms of performance when you get non-uniform weights. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it's harder. Uh, and, and one of the, but it's, it's very domain specific, which, which uh, solver is more effective. So it, it really is the case that it's, it's interesting that that when, when it comes to Maxat, these different approaches really uh, have their different benefits, and this shows up depending on the problem domain, which one to choose. Uh, you know, if you compare it to SAT, where you know CDCL is CDCL, and that's CDCL. So then, on top of it all, you will have a small machine learner that tells you what to do, or we're not there yet. If if you want to do that, go ahead. You can do that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what does this have to do with Maxat? So uh, if we have an optimal hitting set of the set of unsatisfiable cores of your Maxat instance. So now our uh, collection of sets uh, is the set of uh, collection of unsatisfiable cores of the instance of which there's plenty, of course, exponential number of them. Uh, so if you compute the, any optimal hitting set of the unsat cores, then uh, if you rule out the, the soft clauses in that optimal hitting set, and 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 you know that there's a there's an, a solution to the rest of the clauses in terms of sat. So the, the rest of the clauses are unsatisfiable, and that will be an optimal solution <clears throat> to your maxat instance because you computed an optimal minimum cost hitting set, uh, ruling out all of the inconsistencies. So all of the cores. So you're, you're sort of relaxing all of the cores away by computing a hitting set. There's only one issue here. So we, we don't want to compute the whole set of the unsatisfiable cores, right? Because that's a big one. So that's what I said. So, so uh, already, sorry. So uh, the key insight is then that you just want to find a, a hitting set of the unsat cores, but you want to find it somehow implicitly in hope. Hope you just try to hit some cores and hope for the best and uh, put, to put it short distance to work quite well. And then you just need to call a SAT solver once you've been lucky to get a solution and then you're done. So you need to do this, of course, iteratively. So you don't want to uh, uh, compute a huge pile of cores, but you want to compute cores fast. So what iteratively is done, then in the implicit hitting set approach, you accumulate a collection of unset cores, so compute cores, and then compute a hitting set over the cores, and then uh, rule out those 
the cl soft clauses in that heating set, you compute it from the rest, the next sat solver core. And then you get more cores and then just compute another heating set until the sat solver uh, returns a satisfying assignment that will be an optimal solution. And the heating sets are in practice computed just with an integer programming solver. Now I, now I said that Maxat this is, can be integer programming and now we're using integer programming inside Maxat solver. Isn't this interesting? But the interesting bit here is that we're using it for, to solve a completely different problem. It doesn't know anything about the actual problem except for the costs, the, the, the weights of the unit clauses. And it, it just has this, you know, at least one constraint, uh, the IP of, of the min cost hitting set, uh, stating that you need to hit this set. And, and it doesn't know that it's, it, this deals with max of course. Uh, but in, in some sense now we're sort of using IP at its best because it doesn't really know much about the problem, but it can deal with these cost objective functions well in a, in a fairly unconstrained setting. Uh, uh, and, and such solvers of course are good as providing us cores. And, and now uh, the difference of course, compared to core guided approaches where you keep on bloating up this, the formula that the such solver is called on with this cardinality constraint and you're not doing anything like that. You're using uh, assumption, the assumptions interface to sort of rule out some of the soft clauses from consideration at each iteration. And, and uh, so in hope that actually those instances are easier to solve rather than getting bloated and harder to solve. And what's getting bloated gradually is the IP, the mean cost heating set IP. Yeah, I like to, to show this illustration, but this is again how it works. So essentially you give the cost function, uh, uh, so the weights of the soft clauses to the mean cost heating set. Uh, and then uh, you start with the, you don't have a heating set, you don't have any cores. And then at the first iteration, you essentially just check with the SAT solver if you can satisfy all soft clauses. Typically that tends not to be the case in optimization. So you get a core, you add it to your set of cores, which was still empty. And then you ask for a trivial hitting set of one core. You get something, you hit one soft clause, you remove that soft clause from consideration for the next SAT solver call. And you keep on doing this cycle in principle like this until the SAT solver says SAT and you're at an optimal, probably optimal solution. Uh, things are not like, don't work this directly in, in practice. You have to pull out a lot of tricks to make this really, really efficient. Uh, but the, the, still the underlying framework is like this. And as I said, this can be used for anything because you have a core extractor of whatever your problem is and you have a mean cost hitting set or which can sort of have an arbitrary objective function. You just need, if in principle, you could do quadratic objectives if you have a QP solver that's effective. Uh, and, and you can have a QBF solver, you can have an SMT solver, you can have, you know, whatever. So ASP solver, uh, anything that provides us course. But now we're talking about Maxat, so that's all. Um, Okay, so uh, continuing with our shortest past example, this is maybe a bit naive in, when it comes to uh, implicit hitting sets, but let's see what could happen. Um, so the intuition now is that uh, the hitting sets are sort of guesses of candidate paths, given the core information that we currently have. And as long as we don't have enough core information, then there's no way of the hitting set providing sort of paths to us. Meaning, of course, the hitting sets are talking about those, those soft units of, over the cells that we don't satisfy, which are exactly the, the, the grid cells that we're visiting on our path. So the hitting sets try to talk about the path, right? The path that we're constructing. And the SAT solver is trying now verifying the candidate and typically saying, no, 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 no. But you have to visit at least this, this cell and this cell or this cell, because this is not a path. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a question. Uh, 
that since you have this hitting set problem, I mean, that is also an optimization problem. And so you sort of can ask why you don't run the Maxat solver on it. So, so Nikolai yeah. asks, uh, can you explain, can you explain <laughs> why Maxat solvers are bad at min hitting set problems? Is it inherent yeah, yeah. or for Maxat solvers using CDCL or other, other explanations? Because Nikolai used the underline, I, my short answer is no. No, I, no. You, you can try it out uh, or you can do funky stuff like take an, an I, uh, implicit hitting set solver and solve the hitting set problem with that. No, so, so but I, I, don't have a, I don't have a proper uh, idea of it. But like feeding the max, the, the hitting set sub problem to, to a max set solver would, would not be a good idea. You can do it. Oh, it's pretty it, bad. There, yeah. The, the, the uh, core guide is really, really bad at these hitting set problems. Mm. I, I tried. So, so uh, if mm -hmm. you have the uh, LP relaxation helps, I mean, the, the, yeah. for the hitting set domains, there are certain heuristics that but but I just wonder what if if there's something principled to say. Yeah, it's a, that's actually a good good question. Mm. Carlos yeah, is I, also yeah. Sorry. No, no, I I don't have a a real answer to this. So, so another idea I was toying with was to recursively solve the. Uh, the heating set problem with another heating set and then recursively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, 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 that's uh, very interesting. <laughs> you just have this idea of mirrors inside mirrors. You can do it indefinitely. Uh, okay, Carlos, do you send to the MIP solver any subset of the hard clauses? Uh, there are things that are done, but not really directly. Um, you can sort of get uh, cores, uh, identify cores uh, in the beginning, but not, not, not really much when it comes to the actual uh, search part, no. As far as I know, so Fahim, you know, has some weird looking tricks in MaxHS, which maybe work on some specific instance uh, that are maybe not as, you know, uh, something that you could really publish on and uh, algorithmically. Uh, maybe, do Jeremias have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of constraint seeding. So we do send. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what, that's we what I refer to. Yeah. Yeah. But not. Say, say again. You. I, it was hard to hear. If you have, so if you have a clause containing only blocking variables, you can just convert that into a linear inequality and give that to the MIP solver, for example. Yeah. And this kind of stuff is done on a sort of more technical level. So. So you can sort of make infer that okay, I have these assumptions, and 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 okay, they actually, I can quickly infer that ah okay, so there's there's an actual you, you figure out that there's essentially a clause over just assumptions. That's of course immediately a core, in some sense, right? So you can feed that, and that's done in the beginning, but I I think still not 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 really. Um, in other contexts we've done so if people follow the ASP talk by Thorsten I think it was a week ago so uh, I did with a studio of mine uh, an ASP hitting set uh, optimizer and, and there so depending on your problem domain you can do things like use different kinds of LP relaxa relaxations and their LP relaxations when you, when you have the power of, of a MIP solver as well so, but in Maxad, nothing really is done. Okay, um, so let me continue um, so that we'll hear about the incomplete as well. So, yeah, um, so 
as I said, implicit hitting set uh, solver, uh, sorry, hitting set solver provides us candidate path as, and, and, and such solver says that no, no, that's not a path. Here's a um, <clears throat> Okay, so so our hitting set is first empty, so so uh, we'll just check with the SAT solver if, if S is G, and that's not the case. Um, so we get a core stating, for example, just like in the RMS's example, stating that you know we need to visit one of G's neighbors. Uh, so here's the core over Q R and G, uh, K, um, <clears throat> and then the IP solver gets this as a, as a, as a core and, and there's a, picks one of these as a hitting set, say Q. And now, now we rule out Q and ask if, if there's, uh, there's a path essentially that goes only through Q. And that's of course not the case, for example, because of A and B are not visited, then you have to go through A or B. So that's an, a core. And this is a bit of a trivial example because it turns out that if, if you do in this problem setting, all of the cores will be disjoint and over unit clauses as well. Um, <clears throat> so, and this con continues. So now you get a hitting set that hits one of the cores. Notice that it changed. It used to be Q, now it's K. And then this is how, how uh, what happens. So you don't really have a focused view. So you always compute a hitting set over the set of cores and it's independent of the previous hitting set over the course that you had. <clears throat> uh, now you hit A and Q and remove that. And then there's always this barrier that you have to go through and it continues. Barrier, 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 okay? And at some point uh, the IP solver guesses right in terms of hitting something optimally that con consists of a path. Now notice that we had all these cores, these barriers, so it can also hit really badly. So it can hit all these cores, but in a wrong way, and that doesn't constitute the path still. So this is quite a problematic case as well, I think, for an implicit hitting set solver. It has to be quite lucky. Um, so, but yeah, but when it's lucky and it does hit uh, correctly, and of course, uh, when you're at the correct bound, you're almost you've almost solved the problem. Uh, and let me—that's a good, nice bridge to stating that you really don't implement the implicit hitting approach like as the rudimentary, uh, you know, skeleton as I as I showed you. So. Uh, you do all sorts of tricks. For example, you do a disjoint phase where you don't just extract one core at each iteration with the set solver, but you do a disjoint phase where you extract the core and then tell the solver, disregard those clauses, is there another core? Disregard those clauses as well, is there another core? So you get these disjoint cores, uh, essentially for free because after the first call, the set solver's calls tend to be quite trivial. Uh, and then you can throw all of the cores to the next uh, hitting set IP call. Then you can use uh, tricks from the classical IP literature because there's an LP solver there. Uh, so for example, you get reduced costs uh, and, and this allows you to actually start fixing uh, values of variables to, to so it's essentially these reduced costs tell us that uh, given that we have tight enough lower and lower bounds currently, uh, <clears throat> we can actually uh, infer that we can deem a soft clause not to be satisfied. We can just fix the assumption variable to true in that clause. Or we can deem that, okay, we can fix this assumption to false. There's an optimal solution that fixes uh, source, uh, the, the 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 satisfies the soft clause and this upper and lower bound information comes from these tricks actually so you do this disjoint phase and at some point the sat solver says start but that has nothing to do with an optimal solution really but it gives us a bound because it gives us some solution so it gives us an upper bound right uh, so you have these bounds information that you can use in collaboration with the ip tricks 
And Jeremy has last year proposed that Sat even got the best paper award for this abstract course that sort of brings some elements of the core guided approaches to intensity things and, and binds, binds sort of cores together in a more because if you noticed in the hitting set approach, it's sort of the IP solver doesn't really, you know, it's it's a bit lost, can be a bit lost. And it's a good example of uh, how the shortest path example that shows. Is and these are really- Anything what these abstract cores are, or this would be a separate seminar? Jeremy, do you have a sentence on that? You add extension variables to the hitting set problem that are more expressive and can capture cores more expressively. That's a very short explanation, but so somehow they bind bind the cores together better. Okay, thanks. And and oh, oh. Uh, yeah, so Cplex, uh, yeah, you can use Soplex. It doesn't affect performance much. You might see some degradation, but as, as Soplex is quite good. Uh, so these are still not that hard. You know, We're, there's a lot of iterations and, and these calls are not too hard. So you won't lose much. I don't know why we and everyone else wants to use Cplex. I think there's no reason except that it's the first thing that comes to mind still. Uh, due to history. How many iterations? Aha. Uh -huh. That depends a lot on the instance. And the other point, thing to point out is that another question that someone typically asks is that, uh, what, uh, what's the bottleneck? And it's really interesting that it depends on the problem as well, a lot. So sometimes the SAT solver is the bottleneck, the core extraction is the bottleneck. And ah, and in, in, in implicit hitting set algorithms, you need to minimize the cores uh, or to a great extent, find small cores. So you sort of minimize them to a threshold. And then if you're using too much time for minimization, you should give up, uh, but you really want tight, as tight cores as possible. Uh, but yeah, sometimes the, the hitting set problem gets bad. Sometimes the core extraction gets bad and then often neither get, and that's why it's, it's sort of competitive. And, and the, well, I, I don't know who wrote this usually superior to Cplex, but uh, it's interesting really, to notice that if you think about Maxad uh, encodings or problems, then then uh, when Cplex is good, implicit in his uh, approach tends to be good as well. But and and you can beat Cplex with this. All right. Uh, yeah. Then maybe. Jeremias can continue with the incomplete stuff unless there's more questions. So uh, just a just a comment. I, I'm um, I, I have a little toy where I combine hitting sets with core guided, and I found it uh, quite useful for finding um, near optimal solutions. Mm -hmm. You have a two phases one one where it finds as many cores as it can cheaply, and then does hitting sets over those, and when, once it runs over, out of steam, does uh, core relaxation uh -huh. to, to make progress. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, I just wonder that there must be a lot of uh, um, things one can draw in from, say, core enumeration techniques to 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 leverage this hitting set world. Yeah, I, I think the the if you think about these different current approaches, putting them in the right way together would be the what you would want to do. The question right. is I mean, only... It, yeah, so, so I think there are two things I haven't seen. One is to leverage core enumeration, and the other is um, to uh, refine upper bound. So that maybe that's your next uh, section, but you can, you can really, uh, as you do this core enumeration, you find 
local solutions that you can also improve. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and to really uh, and that feeds back into course. So, in in in, in practice, though, so uh, uh, some years ago we actually did a sort of a maxat based implicit hitting set approach for a specific problem domain, and and. If you go beyond these sort of evaluations where you have these heterogeneous benchmark sets and you actually know more about your problem yep. and you know actually how to get really good cores in, in different ways than just using a SAT solver. And in that domain that we were working with, it's sort of causal discovery. Uh, the, the SAT solver gave horrible cores, just really huge. And, mm. and there were very small ones that you, we sort of figured out a sort of an automatized way to figure out these templates that you can quickly compute the cores out of uh, uh, some cores out of your input. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that now, now sort of the world opens up because if you start pu plugging in this domain specific information to this, this type of an approach, it, it really helps. So that's like in Carnelis constraints. Sorry? You're essentially detecting some cardinality constraints. No, no, no. So this is really a domain specific. So this in this this setting, there's a weird notion of paths and and, and uh, very complicated notion of paths uh, and, okay. and inconsistencies um, between paths and, and and now you figure out small cores that the SAT solver never could find. So you could have we we could have cores of length three and the SAT solver would give us cores of length forty. And so without this information, the approach wouldn't work really too well. But if you know this, then it does. So you have to feed, sort of help the solver to start. And, and now you start getting better up, bound in, bounce information, right? As well. OK, so uh, yeah, Jeremias, I guess you can continue. Yeah, you need to just. Stop sharing. Ah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, there we go. <laughs> right. All right. So we're running out of time, and we, as you can see, we got a lot of things to talk about. So I'll, I'll briefly go over some things in the incomplete world and shamelessly pick my own work to talk about some more. Uh, so why would do? Why do we want to do incomplete solving? Well, the obvious answer is scalability. And the second obvious answer is that in many practical applications, we might not care about a formal proof of optimality. If we have a good solution, it might not matter if it's not provably the optimal one. And instead, we just want to find a good solution as fast as possible. And especially in Maxat, the incomplete approaches tend to be these so-called anytime algorithms that find intermediate solutions. This has been hinted upon in this here already. So as um, essentially all of the two different types of algorithms that we've talked about here, effective implementations of them do find uh, non-optimal solutions during a search. And if you terminate them, they can give you one of those. They might not be optim uh, you might not get guarantees on, on their quality, but in practice, they often are quite good. And this includes the core guided and the implicit things that based the algorithms. So the central question in, in incomplete solving is actually how do we combine these different approaches and shift their focus from trying to prove optimality as efficiently as possible to instead trying to find a solution that is as good as possible quickly. So if we look at the solvers from last year's Maxed evaluation in the incomplete track, we see that almost all of them implement more than a single algorithm type. So the deal here is, is, is very much to take different kinds of algorithms and try to make as effective use of them as possible. Instead of just picking one approach and sticking with it until you find your optimal, optimality proof or, or have to terminate. So here are the three approaches I'm gonna mention talk, say something about. The first is to go back to the model improving search and quickly show, talk a bit about why that isn't as effective on many as a complete approach and what you can do to make it more effective in the incomplete setting. 
And then the one I'm going to talk a bit more about is what we call core boosted search. This is work I did with Peter Stucky and Emir Demirovic. Uh, with, and it's an algorithm that combines core guided and model improving search in a very much non trivial way. And finally, if I have time, I'll say something about some stochastic local search approaches that have been proposed for Maxat. So model improving search should in this, this we already talked about. This is just, you get a solution, for example, by invoking a SAT solver on your hard clauses. And then you encode this cardinality constraint that says, give me another solution that is better. And then you keep on going until the SAT solver tells you, now I can't find a, a solution that is better. And why this isn't good as effective on, as a complete approach, we've sort of already touched upon. And it's because of this encoding of the cardinality constraints. And in a more general case, the pseudo Boolean constraint, uh, they can get very large. And if you have millions of soft clauses, you end up just choking the solver on this large constraint. But in the incomplete setting, there's been some clever work on what you can do to sort of make that easier. And one is the so-called varying res the re resolution approach where you just bluntly take a constant and divide all of your weights by that constant and just leave out weights that who's, with weight, leave out clauses whose weight go to zero when you divide because you're just looking for a solution. You're not necessarily looking for the best possible one and you don't need to guarantee optimality. And the second improvement is the, this then the core boosted search that I'm gonna spend most of the remaining time on. So the intuition for to see the intuition for core boosted search, search, we go back to this grid and the core guided approach. As I hope is clear to most of you by now, when we invoke a maxat solver on this instance, we're asking for the sh shortest path from S to G. But if you now remember the approach where you relax each course separately, we can see what happens after a few iterations. So this relaxed formula can be seen as asking, what is the length of the shortest path that goes from any, goes from the core, one of the variables of the core in the core AB to one of the, the squares in the core Q, QK or R. So this is a new Maxat instance that has a lower optimal cost. And there's nothing that actually says that we have to keep on doing this core guided approach. We can just stop at any point and change to another approach. And this is essentially what we call core boosted search. So we start in a core guided phase. And if we happen to find the optimal solution, we're happy and we end. If not, we then take the final reformulated instance and give that to a model improving algorithm. And the intuition for why we would want to do this, it comes from these bottlenecks that we've already talked about. So for the core guided phase, you don't have to use big cardinality constraints, but the core extraction steps can be get increasingly more difficult. And in model improving case, the initial size of the pseudo Boolean or cardinality constraint might be really large. So you might want to try to do anything you can to decrease it. So by Combining these two in this, in this way, we're expecting to get something that it's never significantly worse than either one of these individual components. But actually what we found is that this combination can even be better than even any single, than either of its components. Here's a plot showing the evolution of the gap. That, uh, that means difference between the upper and the lower bond over time uh, on a specific instance. The blue line up here is the linear search component, which is the model improving algorithm. And we see that the pseudo Boolean is the weighted instance. So the pseudo Boolean constraint is just too large for the solver to make any progress over the five minutes that we gave it. Uh, and now the orange line here is a core guided component, which initially is able to find some cores and improve, improve the bound but then after, after some time, it stagnates and gets stuck in this plateau. And then finally, this combination, this core boosted search starts off in the core guided search, matching its performance. And then before the stagnation appear, happens, it switches to the linear phase. 
And due to the reform, reformulation steps done during the core guided phase, the new pseudo Boolean constraint is actually small enough for the solver to be able to make further progress and find easily the best solution out of all of these three. And after publishing this work, it's been further improved by putting a local search shot solver at the start. And this led to state of the art performance in the incomplete category on the unweighted instances. And then for the weighted instances, what you want to do is basically a sort of stochastic local search approach. So as I'm sure many of you can see, the hard part for a basic uh, for a stochastic local search in, in SAT is to guarantee, you need to guarantee that your hard clauses are satisfied. So if you just go around flipping literals, it's very hard to make sure of that. So there are some proposed solutions to this. And one very natural one is to extend the weight function that you have to all clauses. That means the hard clauses as well. You start off by putting some weight, they use one as the weight for hard clauses. And then you keep flipping literals and, and increasing the weights of clauses that are frequently unsatisfied with the hope of finding solutions that actually satisfy all of, all of, all of your hard clauses as well. But it turns out that a better idea is simply to use a SAT solver to make sure that you find solutions that satisfy the hard clauses. So in, very briefly, this is the final time we go, we'll go back to the grid. You have a solution, then you start looking at all of your soft clauses. First, you look at the soft clause, not A. You see that your current solution falsifies it because the path goes through A. So you ask the SAT solver for a new solution that follows all of, your, all of the soft clauses that you've already assigned plus the new one. So you're saying, find me a path that does not go through A. SAT solver is happy to give you one, for example, this one. And then you move on to your next soft clause, which is B. Now in this solution, the path goes through B. So you're again asking the SAT solver for a solution that does not, that satisfies the clause. That means the path that does not go through B, but also satisfies the previous clause. So you're asking it for a path that does not go through B nor A. And this time it cannot find one. So you add the negation of your soft clause into, fi into the fixed clauses. And whenever you find a clause that is already satisfied by your best solution, you don't need the that solver and you just keep going. And by doing this, you actually end up with a currently state of the art, art approach on the, in the incomplete category for weighted instances. So this is my, this is the very much a um, uh, shortened version of the, this part of the talk. We're trying to find, increase the scalability of MaxSat solvers without sacrificing the solution quality too much. And of, of, the, of, of the different approaches that exist, we've seen that they tend to exhibit orthogonal performance on different domains. As Matti also said, it very much depends on the problem domain. And hence, in order to be as good as possible, you want to try to combine solvers, combine solving techniques as well as, as, as well as you can. And this is from the tutorial part. If you want to try your solvers, this you should go to the evaluation. I'll try to try an incomplete solver. You should go to the evaluation web page to see how well they did. But again, if you have a new domain, it's very much possible that some other solver is going to be the best one for your domain. So it might pay off to try the other ones as well. So should I want to just wrap this up or do you want to say something? I, mean, I have a question actually, I guess we already talked about this a little bit, but again, the understanding uh, like which algorithmically, which approaches are good for which type of problem. Is there, is there anything we can say like, yeah, I mean, I don't know, core guided is good for problem instances of type such and such and model improving seems to be much better for problems of type, whatever, or no, there is, not really. There's, there's nothing that I'm happy with. You can say stuff like, if you have a low optimal cost, then you might wanna do a core guided search, which is essentially essentially a lower binding search. But at the same time, how would you know if your, if your cost is optimal? Then if you have lots of diverse weights, it might pay off to try the, the IHS implicit set approaches because then you're letting a MIP solver do the weight handling. 
And if you have a high optimal path, you want to could try and uh, model improving. But beyond experimental level, like testing and these sort of, in my opinion, a bit, maybe even a bit naive statements. I don't know. It would and be interesting cost, to have a better one. And the cost of different weights, would that be because it, like the, the encodings get expensive or is it also like for other reasons? Uh, if you have a lot, lots of different weights, uh, then a core guided approach needs to, the standard trick that Matti alluded to, to will result in lots of residual weights. So you're going to get a, a more significant blow up in your formula if you're doing a purely core guided approach. And the PB constraint on the model improving side, uh, the encodings for the PB constraints that are commonly used, the size of them depend on, on the, the more diverse you have your weights, the larger your encoding is going to be. So mm -hmm. hence you just blow up the formula more and more. And then there's one more question because you, you mentioned this idea of, of somehow just dividing the weights and do sort of a, if I understood, like a rough search first and then maybe look yeah, at the exactly. actual problem when you run. There is also, I think this, uh, what is referred to if I'm using the correct terminology as stratification, where you just basically just look at the large weights first. Is that yeah, sort of is... kind of the same or is it uh, slightly different or how do they compare? Um... In stratification, you're essentially not changing the weights. Uh, you're just saying that I'm going to look at the this subset of weights first and try to find my course and do relaxations over those. In the varying resolution that I mentioned, the, you're dividing the weights in order to also decrease the size of the PB constraints in your rough search. So very sort of roughly speaking, the approach I mentioned here is for model improving search, while the stratification is for core guided search. Mm. We'll see. Thanks. Do you have a question, Nikolai? Yeah. Uh, do you know if any of the core guided methods backtrack over which course it uses for relaxation, or they always fix with a relaxation? I think in your, as, you said as far as I, as far as I know, they don't backtrack but that would be an interesting question to explore if you should and how you should in that case right, because if you make a bad decision you're basically host yeah the, the problem might be that the encode the relaxation the clauses you introduce if you then decide to backtrack you might have to sort of restart your set solver yeah but there that might pay off i said i i like the idea but the question is, have anybody done, I mean, is there any, is there anything as far as, known about it? Uh, as far as I know, no. Uh, and we had a few more slides just summing up what we talked about. There are a number of different approaches that you can use. Uh, developing an intuition for what you want to use or a theoretical understanding would even be even better and an interesting future work. Um, and then some further reading. Fahim gave a talk on similar topics just a while ago. And I, I'm, I'm actually going to give a shorter talk on max at pre-processing in, in the beginning in May as well. So you're all welcome to come there. I guess we're sort of out of time. I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions. But if there are none, I, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Well, a big thanks to both of you. I think we usually go over time. So I'd say there's, you know, okay. people can always exit when they like. And uh, if there are any questions, and if the speakers still have energy to answer, then we're happy to take yeah, questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in no hurry, so, so go for it. I have a question. Yeah. About this unset course, I asked before. <clears throat> for computing this unset course, you only consider the. I understood that you only consider this uh, soft clauses, but might mm -hmm. it make sense to consider also the hard clauses? I mean, for the example you presented, it makes sense without hard clauses, but maybe in another example, consider um, compute the the answer call. Maybe which contains also hard clauses, but then 
just somehow not not consider them, discard them. I don't know whether this was clear. Well, in a way, Based sort question. of. No, there are people who are better at set solvers than what I, than than me. But but it feels to me that by using these assumption variables and putting them on a soft clause, I don't know if it would be harder or more complicated to compute the sort of full unset core with the hard clauses as well compared to only computing the soft clause part. For maxset, you still have to satisfy all of your hard clauses, so that's sort of why you don't why we don't care so to say but that's an interesting question you, you yeah, because, would get more info because i was thinking maybe these um, soft clauses altogether are not unsat but together with the hard clauses they become everything becomes unsat this was my intuition but i don't know i'm not a max i mean expert. that is usually the case i mean as with the example that we saw here the soft clauses usually encode some kind of an objective function. So if you just take the soft, if you have the path example, if you just take the soft clauses, the solver will just say, well, don't don't visit any nodes. So you need the hard clauses to, to sort of get the unsatisfiability. Okay. So that is usually the case. You need the hard clauses to have unset <laughs> in many practical benchmarks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I, I also uh, forgot to mention by put it in the chat that workshop, Simon's workshop participants, those who are registered for the Simon's workshop should have access to the Gather Town workshop room and you're welcome to, to meet there after the seminar, or I guess already now. Um, so I should have mentioned. Uh, another thing I could perhaps mention is that Next week, we're having a talk by Bart Bogarts on explainable constraint programming, I think, sort of. Hopefully, the Simon's web page would contain more information. And I think the week after that, on April 27th, we're doing uh, QBF solving with Martina Seidel. Um, just by, you know, program announcements. Um, anything else? Um, we did have a lot of questions during the seminar proper. So maybe people feel they got to ask what they needed to ask. I don't see anything in the chat at this point. If any other participants want to ask anything, then please. So I guess what, one thing at a, yeah, so like a high level question, you, you sort of alluded to it a little bit, I guess, that this implicit hitting set approach is sort of a, a hybrid approach in the sense that you're using stuff that MIP solvers are good at, and then you're using you're somehow combining the Boolean search that Maxat provides with the more LP kind of view that MIP solvers would provide. Have you thought about, or or, or do you know if anyone has explored like a, a tighter, say, Maxat LP slash MIP integration, or would that make sense? I, that would that would be interesting, and I, I'm assuming you might be alluding to your own paper on on this. No, I'm not. We have certainly pursued. I don't view this as a. I, <laughs> I'm not doing self plugs all the time. So no, no. Uh, but I mean, I I, I read we, that, and it, it feels like you could maybe do something similar with Matsat, perhaps. So. I don't know of any approaches that go beyond this reduced cost that Max Mati was talking about, but I'm sure there is something to do to do there. Um, yeah, no, but I, because it's somehow, I mean, it's a very high level, like you basically take two black boxes and it's a bit intriguing that you somehow identify this part where, um, yeah, somehow the, the, the L, um, MIP solvers are very good at this type of problem, and then the MaxSat solver is like good at the other. Uh, and it's like, well, yeah, I, I, mean, I, sure. I, I mean, you could, you could like imagine, like, I don't know, having a MaxSat solver and then once in a while just solving an LP relaxation, except that 
somehow I don't think when you're having a CNF and you're relaxing, I guess those are pretty terrible relaxations, I guess. Uh, this, this is sort of, this is my thoughts when reading these approaches. I don't know if, if people who aren't better at LP relaxation say they are, they are, I'll take your word for it. But, but that would be interesting to know if you could gain something. I, I, I don't claim to know what I'm talking about at this point. I'm mostly speculating. Maybe Nikolai wants to say anything. It, maybe it's related. To, do you run um, MIP solvers on the MagSat competition? Set. Oh yeah, this is yeah good good yes there was a solver a few years ago I can't remember exactly but there was one uh, which sort of just worked I think it worked there might be something else but but in broad terms it worked by encoding it as MIP and solving it with, uh, it, yeah. with a MIP solver just just uh, just the classic or like direct encoding it would be At good some... to just have a baseline to to so so it's well known what the what the comparison points are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At some like point, how, just... is, it, is it clear how Skip would perform, say, and then the latest so, competition? So some years ago, it used to be that if you run, you know, you would just win. <laughs> but it's not anymore the case. The yeah, Carlos is saying ILP. But I think the, the current question is okay. So how does it compare to MIP? And then if, if the competition evaluation basically has a vanilla max set uh, encoding into MIP, which, which is, I mean, totally trivial, right? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you heard what I said, but it used to be the case like you used some years be. ago. Right. Some years ago, uh, it was the case that if you just run, you know, Cplex or whatever, you would win. Uh, or be the best in the evaluation, but it's not anymore the case. Uh, yeah, but it's true that it should be there by default. That's a very good point. One should just have it there always yeah. as a comparison, as a baseline, because that's clear that it's clear that you would need to win it. But it's of course the same if you think about you know. <laughs> If you want to incentivize people to work on it, it's, it's yeah. good to maybe not have it there until you're better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> but I mean, it's it's all all it is a relevant but, question because, like, I think if you take the, I think if you take the pseudo Boolean competition. Um, which doesn't happen very often. I guess latest version was in 2016. And so, and you run skip on it. Even, I don't know, I, I guess like European CPLEX would be even better. But I think skip, the MIP solver skip wins the pseudo Boolean competition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that sure. is, of course, I mean, that is depressing. Yeah. Uh, uh, but for Maxa, Maxa this, uh, it's not the case, I think, anymore. If you, if you do it, I think you won't win. Uh, be the best, but but yeah, for PV, I think because it's pretty much MIP then already, so it's sort of in the ballpark of MIP, MIP solvers. Another thing is, of course, that what 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 where are the where are the benchmark like, like the problem domains that are uh, clearly PBO that di and how how do they differentiate from MIP uh, in general? Yeah, that's to, a good point. to an extent that the you know the classical branch and cut doesn't just kill the competition. Well, so I mean, it's not the case in general. I think it's a, a benchmark selection problem. Also, for instance, I mean, we've seen that. I think if you want to analyze, say, like binarized neural networks, then I think it seems to be somewhat conventional-ish wisdom that MIP solvers are not so good because they somehow, when you relax these, like what, whatever they're called, these ReLU constraints, activation constraints, they're like not good for LP relaxations. Also, I think we've seen that, that um, um, this is, say like hardware circuit verification problems, MIP doesn't seem terribly good. Whereas PB pseudo Boolean solvers can be really good, and also pseudo Boolean solvers can be really good for binary neural networks. And I guess MaxSat solvers have been used for like this robust or adversarial <laughs> learning and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's a matter of how logical the somehow how how good is it is it to reason over the actual problem 
Well, than... but, all, but also Victor, so there's a very good point, I think, by Victor mm. Miller uh, made in the chat that is worth pointing out that one reason for the superiority of, of Skip, or at least of think of Cplex and Groby, is that their pre-processing works hard to recognize and exploit substructures. And I think also like really to decide uh, things like, oh, it seems like you're you're doing a knapsack problem. Well, I'll pull out my dedicated dynamic programming algorithm to just try to solve this problem. I mean, there are yeah. massive yeah. amounts of 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 like domain knowledge in these. Yeah, it's 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 very interesting because yeah. if you run it on on the on instances that seem very similar on the same dom from the same domain, you see that it chooses different LP solvers uh, and, and and stuff like that as well. Yeah, but, uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you well, Carlos. Yeah, but for that, uh, maybe you need to pass more hard clauses to the CPLEX solver if you want the CPLEX solvers to recognize those, those structures. Because otherwise, you are just having the jetting function, okay, for the heating set, what you are doing, but you need the hard clauses or some part of the hard clauses. For example, what is very important is the detection of clicks. So click detection is very important um, for MaxAt solvers. As you know, in the competition for complete uh, MaxAt solvers, there is a phase of uh, click detection of at most one's constraints. And this is a trick that works very well. This is why I was asking what happens if you plug something that is not Cplex or Kurobi that we know there is some black card going on there, okay? And you just take an open source uh, BIP solvers that maybe they are, they are not applying so much preprocessing. This is an interesting question, but I agree with you that it would be very nice to have this comparison uh, with Cplex, Cplex and Gurobi, just the direct translation and to see what happens. I don't think it's, this is bad for the community. I think this is it should be encouraging for us. Okay. No, no. So, I'm, I, so my, my, my point was that it used to be the case that they win, but they don't anymore. I'm just saying that that in reality, if you organize a PBO competition, for example, and, and the reality is that that currently, you know, Cplex or Gurobi will just blow everything out of out of, out of the water. So <laughs> it's not very, you know. Yeah, but it, well, it, you know, it's good to have it there, but you know, you need to support people. You know, of course, you have to face reality, but 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 you don't get improvement with dif different kinds of algorithmic approaches if you don't encourage them. So, but, so yeah. I have a couple of questions to uh, uh, comments on that. So, uh, so pre-processing, there are papers in MaxSat about pre-processing as well. Right? So I think the, the cardinality detection is, is one of the pre-processing steps I, I added after looking at some flight crew examples. <laughs> it couldn't do the crew examples without this at most two detection um, because I mean otherwise you 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 kill the core extraction and uh, and then there are other uh, approaches that look at how you um, split uh, max set constraints into disjoint sets uh, if the weights are stratified right so uh, the, so there I think there are lots of uh, room one can do in the MaxSat world for just pre-processing. For the for the click detection, uh, that was one. There is some cases where the problem is, and this is related to what you were commenting um, before about the uh, tracking, okay, to to the previous score. So the problem is the order of the course that you retrieve. Because yeah. if you do it in the correct order, just by using the OLL algorithm, you are going to get the same as doing the detection of the clicks. For some problems, this is the case. And this is very important. And it's telling you that the order is actually a key piece of the whole story. Okay. Hmm. So, Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to manage the chat. So, so, so Kieran McCreesh is apparently running off for dinner, but mentions that instances from problems involving matching under preferences might be another good source of candidates for MaxSat and pseudo Boolean solvers. I'm currently grading two master's dissertations on these kind of problems where constraint programming is stomping over MIP and the CP encoding is very SAT friendly 
except for the objective function. Um, I think we've also had some news from Glasgow. I think the Glasgow, well, I don't know if I dare to say this in Nikolai's presence, So, but apparently the Glasgow people did try the pseudo Boolean solver on, on these problems also, and it's killing the MIP solvers. Um, so, and Kieran suggests plugging a seminar on this, which I'm doing now, namely on, this is not a Simon seminar, this is a 2 p.m. Central European time, so maybe not very West Coast friendly, but still um, um, a seminar by William Peterson at the University of Glasgow talking about these kind of problems where, where actually MIP solvers seem to be fairly soundly beaten by other techniques. I think I was interrupting someone though, maybe, or was I? Oh, ah, I didn't, I plugged this in the wrong, wait, let me, let me see, did I post this? The wrong one. No. Oh, maybe? Yep. Kidney. And I guess, Nikolai, you're saying, and as an SMT solver right there, I'm very happy with advances in MaxSet and PB. So you just, an SMT solver, you harness anything you can use. Is that yes, uh, yes. so? <laughs> <laughs> I don't complain. Yeah, I think this is, um, any uh, final questions or comments, which maybe we should let our, our speakers off the hook. I think this is a great discussion, but... Uh... I guess they deserve a break at some point. No, thanks for all the good questions. Good ideas. So I think then on behalf of, of everybody, I'll just thank you so much for a, for a wonderful tutorial. Um, this was great. Um, thanks. And looking forward to see you, all of you uh, then in a, in a week from now about explainable constraint programming. So thanks so much for today. Thank you. Thank you.